I'm a print guy sitting beside two veteran broadcasters, so <laughs> I do have some prepared remarks, so I hope you'll bear with me. Um, I have to see it written or it doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> so there's broad agreement uh, among all policy wonks that harmonized sales tax makes sense, and it's pretty clear that um, the timing of its introduction was driven by Ontario's announcement that it was adopting the HST. Uh, next July, and Ottawa's incentive of $1.6 billion uh, uh, in transition payments. Um, but I think even members of the opposition there and, and uh, those who uh, follow that political route uh, realize that the HST is, in fact, good policy. Uh, and um, with rare exception, they have focused their attack on the manner in which it was introduced rather than the impacts. Um, and those impacts are, are substantial for the drivers of the economy. Uh, mining, forestry, oil and gas, manufacturing, and transportation, uh, savings of nearly $2 billion, uh, and insignificant for most families, uh, amounting to a tax hike of $210 a year for the typical middle class family, and, uh, and they're completely offset for uh, those at the lower end of the income scale. Uh, they could actually come out ahead by $522 a year. Now, these calculations by the finance department don't take into consideration any savings that might be passed along when the provincial sales tax is removed from business inputs. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, the HST is a tough sell. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, an, an opinion leader, uh, uh, no less, took issue with the Sun's editorial in support of the HST. He understood the logic, he told me, but how likely is it that a builder will lower the price of a new house because the hidden cascading sales taxes on building materials have been eliminated. Yeah. Houses are priced on what the market will bear, not on the cost of production, he argued. I told him to go write an op-ed. <laughs> <laughs> I also explained to him in excruciating detail that the HST has the effect of lowering the marginal effective tax rate on investment. That's what Nova Scotia found. Even though it had one of the highest corporate tax rates in the country, its marginal rate became competitive when it brought in the HST. Same thing will happen here. That should lead to more investment, more jobs, more wealth creation. When he woke up, my colleague insisted <laughs> we must urge the government to lower the HST to 10% because it hurts poor people. I said the necessities of life are exempt from this tax. Poor people are protected. They end up winners. He's still not convinced, of course, which is why raising the HST during an election campaign, um, had it been on the radar screen then, would have been a bust. Enhancing BC's macroeconomic profile doesn't really fly as a campaign slogan. I don't see any advantage in lowering the rate to 10% uh, as it is in the first full year of HST after all the offsets, relief and rebates. The province is uh, still in the red with a loss of uh, with about $40 million in uh, provincial sales tax. Now, I'm not a subscriber to the no tax is a good tax uh, philosophy. The government does need revenue to provide services we expect of it, and tax and consumption is as good a way as any to get it. Uh, it's odd that many of those who oppose the HST also rail against the evils of the consumer society. You'd think they'd welcome a consumption tax to breathe life into their uh, reduce, reuse, recycle mantra. Some of the arguments against the HST bear a striking resemblance to those raised many years ago when the goods and services tax was <coughs> introduced to replace the manufacturer's tails, sales tax. Uh, that tax of 14% was the poster child of bad taxes, a uh, burden on business, a disincentive to investment, and completely hidden from public view. The GST probably cost the Conservatives the next election, but over time it gave the federal liberal government the financial wherewithal to balance the books. Now, while I grudgingly accept the notion of taxation, I don't approve of how tax dollars are spent. Which brings us to tonight's other hot button topic. The government claims the deficit is what it is because of the unexpected drop in revenue. The new budget numbers show actual revenues of $38.3 billion in the year just passed and an estimated $37.6 billion in the current fiscal year. So how does a difference of $720 million become a deficit of $2.8 billion? The government doesn't have a revenue problem. It's simply spending too much money. Had it kept spending under control, 
increasing it no more than the rate of population growth and inflation, and had it resisted calls for stimulus, there'd be no deficit. In the fat years, government should put away money for a rainy day. Norway did that with its oil revenues, and now sits on a stash of $400 billion. But the BC government kept piling on debt, even as it was claiming budget surpluses. In the last couple of years alone, it reported budgetary surpluses of $2.9 billion, while adding $4.5 billion to total debt. The five-year fiscal plan sees debt rising to $60 billion in 2013-14, from $38 billion. 2008-09. Debt, debt service costs are already the fourth largest expenditure after health, education, and social welfare. For some reason, neither the opposition nor the media seem to recognize the seriousness of this fiscal mismanagement, preferring instead to focus on who knew what when. Did the finance minister know that revenues would be far below projections and keep it a secret until after the election? Is that a useful question? More to the point would be to ask how the government intends to arrange public finances in a scenario of more retirees supported by fewer younger workers. I think it's hypocritical for the opposition to criticize the government for running a deficit after they clamored for stimulus. A plague on both their houses. Neither party seems inclined to do what is necessary to trim the government's appetite for our money. Thank you so much.